एवरीवन वेलकम टू द हिंदू करंट अफेयर्स फॉर बिगिनर्स लेट्स स्टार्ट आवर टुडे सेशन दीज आर ऑल द टॉपिक्स दैट वी आर गोइंग टू कवर इन आवर टुडेस वीडियो आवर फर्स्ट आर्टिकल इज द एरोगेंस ऑफ द इग्नोरेंट दिस आर्टिकल कम्स अंडर जीएस पेपर 3 अंडर द टॉपिक ऑफ एनवायरनमेंट द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ दिस आर्टिकल इज ऑन फेब्रुवरी 13 द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज रूल्ड दैट नियरली 1.12 मिलियन हाउस होल्ड्स from 17 states has to be evicted by the state governments before july 27 so from this article from the prelims point of view what are important is we should know what is meant by a patent what is this biopiracy and what are the provisions under this forest rights act of 2006 and what is the location of this jarawas and onjis tribes and we should know the provisions of this forest act of 1926 now we'll see all these in detail First of all what is a patent a patent is a statutory right for an invention and that right will be granted for a limited period of time to the person who had claimed this patent by the government in exchange of full disclosure of his or her invention and this patent right will exclude others from making using selling importing the patented product or the process for producing that product without the consent of the patentee so this is what is meant by a patent then what is the term of a patent in the indian system the term of every patent granted is 20 years from the date of filing the application and which act governs the patent system in india it is the patents act of 1970 which was amended in 2006 and the patent rules of 2013 govern the patent system in india and does the indian patent system give protection worldwide that means is that a global patent no the patent protection is a territorial right and it is effective only within the territory of india what can be patented an invention that is related either to a product or process that is new and involving an inventive step and it should be capable of industrial application then only it can be patented that is the criteria for patentability also it should be novel it should be new and it should have an inventive step and it should be capable of industrial application then only it can be patented then what types of inventions are not patentable in india a discovery of a scientific principle or formulation of an abstract theory or discovering a living thing or a non living substance that is occurring in nature will not be patented and a method of agriculture or horticulture will also not be patented a mathematical or business method or a computer program that also cannot be patented a literary dramatic musical or artistic work or any other cinematographic works and television productions cannot be patented or any ppt presentation of information also cannot be pre- patented a scheme or rule or method of performing a mental act or a method of playing a game cannot be patented and inventions that are related to atomic energy also cannot be patented in the notes i have given a detailed notes for what types of inventions are not patentable in india please look into the notes the next thing is biopiracy this term is also mentioned in the article what is this biopiracy it is the practice of commercially exploiting the naturally occurring genetic material or a biochemical by taking another's knowledge about the use of these biological resources to put it simply it is a situation where the indigenous knowledge of nature that is there with the indigenous people for example let us take people who are dwelling in forests they are 
indigenous to that location and they have the knowledge about the medicinal nature of plants in that forest so they have this knowledge of that nature this biopiracy is a situation where this indigenous knowledge from these people is used by others for their profit without the permission of these people and also without any compensation or recognition to these indigenous people in the present context this biopiracy is the exploitation of biological resources or knowledge of farmers and traditional communities and indigenous tribes by many organizations and multinational companies for example patenting of neem and basmati rice by many transnational companies this is a kind of procuring biological wealth from other countries and patenting their products for commercial purpose here what they will do is they will take knowledge from us especially the pharmaceutical companies they are taking knowledge from our medicinal values of our plants and out of these plants they are creating a new drug or a chemical and they are patenting this drug just now we have seen that a discovery of a any living thing or non living substance in the nature cannot be patented so they cannot patent these plants but what they will do is they will make use of these plants in order to make a drug or a chemical and they will patent this this concept is known as biopiracy the next thing is the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of forest rights act of 2006 during the british era they have diverted our forest wealth to meet their economic needs but at the time we had this indian forest act to recognize the rights of the people who were living in the forest but these provisions were not followed the forest dwellers and the tribal communities they lived in the forest without any tenurial security which continued even after the independence because they were marginalized but this scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers act of 2006 was enacted to protect the marginalized socio economic class of citizens and balance their right to the environment with their right to life and livelihood this act will deal with the rights of scheduled tribes and other forest dwelling communities who were occupying and are dependent on the forest land for generations over the land and other resources this act will grant legal recognition to the rights of forest dwelling communities by partially correcting the injustice that was caused by the previous forest laws like indian forest act of 1927 now let us see what are the rights that were recognized under this act this act recognizes the community rights or rights over common property resources of the communities along with individual rights over the property resources and it will recognize the right of ownership to collect use and dispose the minor forest produce it recognizes the right to protect and manage any community forest resource which the communities were traditionally protecting and conserving for the sustainable use and this recognizes the right to rehabilitate in case of illegal eviction or displacement from forest land it recognizes the right to intellectual property and the traditional knowledge that is related to biodiversity and cultural diversity and this act also provides for the diversion of forest land for public utility facilities that were managed by the government like schools dispensaries fair price shops electricity and telecommunication lines water tanks with the recommendation of gram sabhas and with regard to this act we should know what is the eligibility to get rights under this act it is confined only to the people who primarily resides in the forest and who depends on forest and forest land for their livelihood and also 
the person who is claiming for those rights must be a member of scheduled tribes list that is scheduled in that area or he must be residing in the forest for 75 years and this is the eligibility criteria to get the rights under this act then how these rights will be recognized it is the gram sabha or a village assembly which will pass a resolution recommending whose rights to which resources should be recognized and this resolution will be screened and approved at the level of subdivision and the screening committee will consist of three government officials from forest revenue and tribal welfare departments and three elected members of the local body later it will be screened at the district level the next thing is we should know about these onjas and jarawa tribes that were mentioned in this articles there are six aboriginal tribes in the andaman and nicobar islands here now let us look into what are those six tribes and where are they located this onjas tribe belongs to little nicobar sentinelese tribe belongs to sentinel islands zarawa tribe belongs to middle and south andaman andamanese tribes they belong to strait island shonpen tribes belong to great nicobar and nicobaris also belong to great nicobar next thing that is mentioned in this article is indian forest act of 1927 just now we have seen that this act also recognizes the forest dwellers rights and makes the conservation more accountable this act recognizes three types of rights land rights use rights and right to protect and preserve land rights are given to the people who have been cultivating the land before december 13 of 2005 according to this act the next is use rights this law provides the rights to use collect the minor forest produce and the right to protect and conserve this law will give the right to protect and manage the forest by the people of village communities the next article is kartarpur focus this article comes under gs paper 2 under the topic of international relations the sub topic here is india and its neighborhood relations the context of this article is india and pakistan in november of 2018 they have announced that they will build a corridor from dera baba nanak in punjab to kartarpur sahib gurudwara in pakistan's punjab from the prelims point of view in this article there is mention of kartarpur corridor we should know about this and there is a mention of berlin wall and ratcliffe line let us see in detail of these three first let us look into what is this kartarpur corridor this is a corridor that will link india with the kartarpur gurudwara in pakistan in order to facilitate the pilgrims from india to visit pakistan's kartarpur sahib which is located on the banks of river ravi and it is 120 kilometers northeast of lahore this corridor will provide a visa free access to the shrine for the six from india when it becomes ready on both the sides and this corridor will cut down the journey the pilgrims have to make from more than 200 kilometers to just 6 kilometers and this corridor will extend from dera baba nanak in gurdaspur district to the international border in pakistan and here we should also know about this kartarpur gurudwara why it is this famous because this is the place where guru nanak the founder of sikhism had assembled a sikh community and he lived here for the 18 years until his death in 1539 and this shrine is visible from the indian side as the pakistani authorities they generally trim the grass so that so that the indian sikhs used to gather in large numbers for the darshan from the indian side and the next thing is berlin wall this berlin wall which is around 168 km long has separated the city of berlin into communist east berlin and democratic west berlin 
in Germany from 1961 to 1989 and this was constructed by the German Democratic Republic or East Germany in 1961. This was built in order to prevent people from escaping the eastern half of Berlin. This Berlin Wall was officially referred to as Anti-Fascist Protection Rampart by this German Democratic Republic. This West Berlin government used to refer this as the wall of shame while condemning that this wall is restricting the freedom of movement. And the next thing is Radcliffe line. This Radcliffe line is the border line that separated India from Pakistan on 17th August of 1947. This line was named after the chairman of border commissions, Cyril Radcliffe, a lawyer from England. This line is today the international boundary between India and Pakistan on the west side and between India and Bangladesh on the eastern side. The idea behind the Radcliffe line was to create a boundary that would divide India along religious demographics under which Muslim majority provinces will become part of new nation of Pakistan and Hindu and Sikh majority provinces will remain with India. The next article is Seeking the Next Frontier. This article comes under GS Paper 3 under the topic of Science and Technology. Recently, India has successfully testified an anti-satellite missile by shooting down a live satellite Microsat-R located in the lower earth orbit and this project is named as Mission Shakti and it was led by DRTO. From the prelims point of view, from this article, we should know about this. What is this anti-satellite test and we should know lower earth orbit. We should know what is this space debris. We should know about International Space Station. And what is this 1967 Outer Space Treaty and 1979 Moon Agreement and also about this Ballistic Missile Defense Program of India. First, let us look about what is this anti-satellite test. This is the technological capability to hit and destroy satellites in space through a missile that is launched from ground. The first anti-satellite test was carried out by the United States of America in 1959 which was followed by the Soviet Union in 1960 and China in 2007. And India is the fourth country to carry out an anti-missile test. And the most important thing that we should know is there is no international treaty that, that prohibits the testing or the development of this anti-satellite systems. The objective of this technology is aimed at destroying the satellites that were owned by the enemy countries for the military purposes. What would a country gain if the satellites owned by an enemy country is destroyed? Nowadays, the most important applications were satellite based navigation systems, communication networks, banking systems, weather forecasting, disaster management. So a satellite is a critical infrastructure for any country. So destroying a satellite will make all these applications useless and it will cripple the enemy infrastructure without causing any threat to human lives. And according to the rules, the test can be carried out only on one's own satellite. India did so on its imaging satellite Microsat R and that satellite is located in the lower earth orbit which is an orbit around the earth with an altitude that ranges from 160 kilometers to 2000 kilometers above the earth's surface. Then another term that is mentioned here is space debris. What is space debris? Anything that is launched into the space will remain in space almost forever unless it is brought down or it should slowly get disintegrated over decades. So the expired satellites which are of no longer needed will also remain in the space orbiting without any aim in some orbit. So this collection of unwanted objects in the earth's orbit 
which is either man made or natural is called as space debris example of this space debris is the chinese tiangong 1 which crashed into the south pacific ocean is the most recent example of this space debris why the space debris is a threat because the inactive satellites might collide with the active satellites and make them dysfunctional this is the reason why the space debris is a threat and the next thing is what is this ballistic missile defense program of india it is an initiative for developing and deploying a multi dimensional a multi dimensional ballistic missile defense system in order to protect the country from ballistic missile strikes this is being developed by defense research and development organization in order to provide multi layered shield against these ballistic missile attacks our india's ballistic missile development had began in 1999 after the Kargil war in order to strengthen India's defense against possible nuclear attack from Pakistan. Next, let us see what is this International Space Station. This International Space Station is a space station or a habitable artificial satellite that is located in the lower earth orbit and it is the largest human made body in the low earth orbit. It is a joint program between five space agencies NASA of United States, Roscosmos of Russia, JAXA of Japan and European Space Agency of Europe and Canada Space Agency of Canada. This ISS is a joint project between these five space agencies. This International Space Station will serve as a microgravity and space environment research laboratory where the crew members can conduct experiments in biology, human biology, physics, astronomy, meteorology and other fields. Now let's look about this 1961 Outer Space Treaty. This treaty mentions a set of rules that can be applied to the nation's activities in the outer space. To put it simply, it is the constitution that is related to international space law. It defines what a country should do and shouldn't do in the outer space. This was signed on 27th January in 1967 by three nations, UK, US and the Soviet Union. This was ratified by 105 countries. The initial name of this treaty is Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space including Moon and other celestial bodies. What about the legal effect of this treaty? This treaty is technically binding on the countries who sign up for it. If a country wants to withdraw from the treaty, then it will take a year after that country has submitted a written notification of its intentions to these three states, UK, US and Russia, according to Article 16 of this treaty. Then what about any amendments? This treaty even permits the countries to propose amendments. An amendment can only enter into force if it is accepted by majority of the state parties and also that amendment is binding only on the countries that approve for that amendment. Next, let us see what are the provisions of this treaty. There is no place for weapons of mass destruction. According to this treaty, no country can place weapons of mass destruction like nuclear weapons in the orbit of Earth moon or any other celestial body but this treaty doesn't prohibit the launching of ballistic missiles which can be armed with this weapons of mass destruction and according to this treaty moon and outer space celestial bodies they should not be subjected to any weapon testing and this treaty defines the limits of 
moon and other celestial bodies stating that no government can claim a celestial body because they are the common heritage to a mankind and exploration of outer space should be beneficial to all the countries and the space is free for exploration by all the countries according to this treaty and if a country creates any damage then it is liable and fully responsible for that damage in the space caused by its space object the next thing is 1979 moon agreement this agreement has opened for signature in 1979 where it is adopted by the united nations general assembly but it came into force in 1984 the other name for this agreement is agreement governing the activities of states on the moon and other celestial bodies what is this agreement for this agreement is nothing but an elaboration on the provisions of outer space treaty which we have seen just now what this says the new provisions according to this treaty are it says that the moon and celestial bodies should be used only for peaceful purposes without disrupting the environment and the united nations should be informed of the location and also the purpose of any station that is established on these celestial bodies and it says that there is need for an international regime to govern the exploitation of moon and its natural resources and it says to ban all the explorations and use of these celestial bodies without the approval of other states and this agreement has 11 signatories including india the next article is surgical strikes alone can't counter terrorism this article comes under gs paper 3 under the topic of defense lieutenant general huda who led the surgical strikes in 2016 says that the surgical strikes alone can't counter terrorism first of all we should know what is a surgical strike a surgical strike is a military attack that is intended to demolish something specific or a specific target in order to neutralize it this is done with an intention and not to harm the surroundings here the no damage is intended to any structure building or human beings an example of this surgical strike is precision bombing which is conducted systematically and with much coordination to demolish a particular target the recent example for this is the recent precision strike by india post pulwama attack on jaish e mohammed's outfits the next article is arab leaders condemn us for move on golan this article comes under gs paper 2 under the topic of international relations the arab leaders were condemning the recent us declaration of golan heights as the sovereign territory of israel from this article the topics that were important from the prelims point of view are we should know the location of this golan heights and we should know about arab league first let us look into this golan heights golan heights was part of syria until 1967 when israel has captured it that is most of its area in a six day war and later in 1981 it had completely annexed this golan heights syria demands that this unilateral annexation was not recognized internationally and it demands the return of its territory syria tried to regain the golan heights in 1973 through middle east war but it failed later israel and syria has signed an armistice in 1974 and this issue was quiet from them but in 2000 Israel and Syria they again had a highest level talks over the return of this Golan Heights to Syria but again the negotiations have failed and recently US has declared that this Golan Heights is the sovereign territory of Israel and the next thing is Arab League this is a regional organization of Arab countries that were in and around North Africa the horn of africa and arabia the objective of this regional organization is to provide 
economic, political, cultural, scientific and social programs that were designed to promote the interests of Arab world. And this is founded on 22nd March 1945 in Cairo by six members. Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia and Syria. At present, this league has 22 members including Syria but whose participation was suspended since 2011. So students, this is all for today and see you all tomorrow. Thank you.